it's very festive here. And I'm really uh, thankful and happy to be speaking after Dr. Anita Depp because she introduced two things that, according to me, are mostly important. One is most of the diseases that we see in falcons and in birds in general do not have many symptoms or the symptoms are so similar that sometimes it's pretty difficult to gain a proper diagnosis in a quick time. This makes our professional life a little bit difficult compared to uh, colleagues that do work with the species that are more known and show different symptoms like dogs, cats, cows, whatever. And secondly, obviously, there is the prevalence to believe in falconers, not here only, but in Europe, in America, everywhere, that if you have an antibiotic that will fix the problem anyway, and it's not necessarily so. So in my talk I will present you three, four clinical cases that uh, will show exactly what, it, what is going on. You will, have a, you will be presented with a falcon or a bird of prey in general. You will see some symptoms. We, we will try to understand what are the symptoms depending on, make a sort of steps and step-by-step -step procedure to understand what is going on and try to reach a final diagnosis and what the treatment will be. Okay, the first case is about an owl, a snowy owl, that was presented by a customer of mine. Uh, the, the bird is a five years old male and the owner, which is with a big man, he said, listen, doctor, I have a problem because I was feeding my falcons possibly some days ago and I stepped on one of them and I'm sure I did something to the spine of this animal. So there is something going on. I, I would like to have it uh, to have it in your hands and bring it to the clinic and have an idea. The bird is not eating well, has diarrhea and is losing weight. I'm pretty sure I damaged the, 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 the back of the animal. So actually the bird is very thin. We took some radiograph and a little bit of hematology. But the owner said, okay, I don't want to go too much deep. I don't have to, I don't have so many money to waste in this animal. So let's do the minimum. So we make the x-rays and uh, any idea about what we can see? Any suggestion? We have a lot of, let's say, strange spots within the salami cavity. We made lab work and basically there is a leukocytosis which is not, not very high. 30,000 which is uh, not very high for this species. But what impresses me is the percent of heterophytes, which indicates apparently a, an infection. So we made the celioscopy, and this is what we saw inside the body cavity with the endoscope. For who is used to even endoscopy, I'm now approaching the lung of the bird. This should be almost transparent. And what we saw before that was completely yellow are the air sacs, and they should be transparent. I am in the abdominal cavity now, and all these, all the things that you see that is white is not normal. Any guess? Any idea? What, what, what is it? Who says asper? Who says asper? Do you know this? Asper? What I thought it. Fungi? ADTB? Necrotic polycerositis after a bacterial infection? Mycoplasmas? 
bacteria still there, any of these is an option. Pneumonialis. Even eventually a neoplasia, why not? So obviously the bird died, because there was not much to do with this animal, and uh, it turned out to be a very unusual presentation for a tumor that is called Xanthoma. So if you want to summarize this case, okay, it's interesting because not only of the, of the very unusual presentation of itself, but also because the, the relation between the veterinarian and the falconer, or the owner, the man came to me and said, oh, I stepped on a falcon, I, I stepped on an owl, possibly I broke his back. And uh, it's really didn't show anything like that, but it's very important to my eyes that uh, we as vets do listen to what our customers tell us, because in most cases they have something to tell, they have a good perception of their animals because they do live with the animals every single day. In this case, the owner was wrong, but obviously there was an interaction between the two and could be the case that he broke his back. It was not, obviously. <laughs> but if we summarize our, our case, we could suspect an infection. There was leukocytosis, there was a marked uh, heterophilia, and uh, the presence of uh, a high number of uh, toxic heterophiles. Bacteriology, after celioscopy, didn't show any growth. But this is not unusual because even in bacterial infection, when they are long lasting, you might pick up with your endoscope only some necro necrotic tissue. So it's not necessarily true that you pick up the bacteria. I saw all these granulomas and I thought, hmm, it is probably aspergillosis. Even, even if the looking is not very typical, but not every fungi do read the same books. So could be the case. The owner wanted to euthanize the bird, and I obviously did because I didn't see any chance for the poor animal. But in the end, in the end it was something completely different. So in my perspective, and also thinking about what uh, Dr. Depp said before, it was good to separate the bird, and the very good thing is but sadly for the bird is something we can't cure, but it was luckily not some, anything infection to the collection, which is in my eyes when I'm talking about breeding facilities and the large falconers with big collections. Obviously, my primary duty is to keep infectious diseases out of the place because you can lose one bird or two, but it can be dramatic when an infection and contagious disease gets in into the collection because we cannot, we should not never forget that contagious and infections is not synonymous. We might have infectious diseases like aspergillosis which is not contagious and we have diseases that are extremely contagious. Case number two, this is, this is even, this is also a very strange case that I had in my hands some years ago. Step the eagle, also this animal with respiratory sounds and losing weight. What could I think? Pneumonia, aerosaculitis, typical presentation. Aspergillosis, tuberculosis, gape worms. Recently I've seen a lot of birds of prey with gape worms. So what is my procedure? run some hematology to rule out infections, blood chemistry, microbiology, radiology, and endoscopy. Unluckily, I could not retrieve the x-rays, but hematology shows an infection for the species, 25,000 is high enough. Blood chemistry, elevated AST and CPT. Microbiology, no bacterial nor fungi growth. Radiology, some mass in the right lung, and at endoscopy, I could see this. Oh, this is the base of the right lung. With all these, see, these thing that was roughly 
two, three centimeters wide, bulging from the lung into the um, air sac. So what should I think at this point? Any idea? Any guess? I, I thought to do a tumor. Yeah, right, on your right. Yeah, I think it's a uh, fungal Could be, could be. Yeah, could be, because if it is inside the lung, you cannot see. Sometimes it happens that you don't see the fungi themselves or the hyphae. You only see the, 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 the tissue, the lung tissue that is bulging out. I thought to do um, maybe a ham and John or something like this. Obviously, I took into consideration asper and bacteria. What else? How could I proceed? We took a biopsy and we also made a CT scan. Obviously, the owner was uh, a wealthy person. He didn't have any problem with CT scanning, and we did. So, you see, this mass in the lung getting bigger and bigger. So, this is what we saw inside the we took a biopsy also, and we have in our mind a big mass, roughly four centimeters big, imprinting completely the tissue of the right lung and bulging into the air sac. Oh. I sent it to the pathologist who found pieces of a feather into it. So, very unusual presentation of. Uh, Foreign body reaction, a piece of feather that was annihilated by the bird, got into the lung through the trachea, I don't know how it could, and gave this very big reaction. At that point, the thing was so big that I, I didn't think to make the surgery myself. I sent it to the University of Milano, they tried, but sadly, the bird passed by during the procedure. But it's just to show that there are cases that you think it's easy. It is aspergillosis or it is a tumor, and it's not. It's something that I never saw before that and even after. I don't know if you s any of the colleagues see, uh, here has, seen, has something similar, but very unusual. Anybody saw something like that? Mike? No. Very unusual. Red tail, this is also an interesting case because I could find only like three cases in the literature about this. 18, one year and a half old male is referred as an emergency because there are a lot of, uh, there is a lot of blood in the stools. So what I think, enteritis, bacterial, fungal, viral, parasites, obviously, lead toxicosis, other toxins, Maybe some, maybe the bird ate some mice or rats with, with poison. Even the nephritis, because I might believe that when there is frank blood, I also can think to nephritis. So, hematology, what we see? Not much. I mean, the leukocytes are normal, normal heterophils, nothing very impressive. Moderate elevation in the CPK and phosphorus was very high. I don't know why, still to not explain it. We could culture E. coli. That was, uh, this is typical, only sensible to three drugs, one of, of which is the newest drug from Bayer, the Pradofloxacin. And this calls me back to what Dr. Deb said before, uh, the abuse of antibiotics, it is a big problem because we tested like 20 antibiotics and out of these 20, only 3 were usable. Radiology, what we see? Is anything that you can see?
large industry. You can also see it on the latter here. So what we did, we had a look in the cloaca to see if there is anything there because in the end the blood is coming from there. So we are in the cloaca, there is nothing moving, which is very unusual. You should see some movement, and especially some antiperistaltic movement. We had access into the Bursa cloacalis. But everything is looks like stock. There is nothing going back, which is normally what you should see. A little bit of fat in the cloaca wall, which is normal. We see this red mass bulging into the cloaca. It's like a red cylinder from the rectum. What is it? Any idea? So we thought, hmm, can be the intestine itself coming out. So have a look into the abdominal, into the abdominal cavity. And so we got to this. Any idea? What is it? Is a uh, how say intersection? Yeah, or the intestine has got into itself and went through the cloaca. So big problem. Big problem. Normal CVC, blood chemistry, uh, nothing in. Impressive E. coli, air in the gut, which is dilated. We have a dilated bowel, fibrin, and something bulging yes. into the cloaca. And this is the diagnosis. What we do? Surgery. So you can easily see this part of the intestine. This is going into this, and then it will come out of the cloaca. This is a small fibrin piece that we saw at the endoscopy. You have to lift it, close it, seal it, and shoot it back. So you see that there are actually three layers. One is going in, out, and out again. 
So we could open it, and obviously there was a lot of blood inside this. So you see, many cases are not something that you can cure with an antibiotic. You, know? you must be, you must make a proper diagnosis, which is not very easy unless you have the proper tools and, uh, and you know how to use them. Obviously. The last case is uh, also very interesting. This, this is more typical, but I think the surgical approach is very interesting. This is a eight years old male hybrid falcon. Gasping, very strange sounds. So I thought to track it from Loma, gape worms, pneumonia, which can always be the case, and some abdominal masses. Sometimes there are masses that are so big that the birds are not breathing properly. So this is also an option. What we did? Typical procedure that I normally. This is my step-by-step -step procedure. Hematology, blood chemistry, microbiology, radiology, and eventually endoscopy. Okay, so, hematology. You want to say, oh, no, no, no. Blood chemistry, no, come on, don't do this. <coughs> microbiology, you crazy, you want to do this. So, Okay, radiology, he's a... He, he agreed, but I couldn't see it, basically. Mm -hmm. There's nothing to see, nothing impressive. And that's what I mean. Let's see if it works. Mm. What's it? Thank you for my name. There is an obstruction. Can be bacterial, can be a scar from a previous infection, which was the case. So I don't know what was the original, the original problem. Maybe aspergillosis, maybe bacteria, maybe anything else that did cause a trauma in the tracheal mucosa that closed together and sealed. So the bird actually was not threatened. So what we can do? What is the normal approach? Take it out. So this is also interesting. I mean, this is something that is, I didn't say common, but it's not also it's not unusual. So the important thing is that you're able to deliver the anesthesia through the air sacs, so you have the head and the tracker free to work. You spot the place that likely you will access with the inner surgery. Leave the trachea and isolate it. <coughs> what I normally use, what I normally do when I have this kind of surgery is I use my endoscope to spot exactly with the light the place where I want to cut, which is better than measuring. I think physically you see it, and then I put a small needle where there is a lesion so I will not lose it. So I put a needle there in the trachea and I know where I have to cut. I cut the trachea, you can see the open trachea, this part with the needle, let's up. resection of the trachea, and you see the two pieces of trachea here that are open, one and two, and we close it back. This the inner view of the trachea post surgery. And if I continue to it, now more than one year that we made it and there are now reoccurrences. So, I hope this is correct. <laughs> so these are the cases. If there is any question, I'll be happy to answer. Thank you.